start, I'd just like to say a short Namuriuri Karaki or a prayer, just to invoke the blessings of uh, my ancestors before we um, begin this presentation. Tuni nui rino nga nga nui urangi ra hia, pe tungi te uni tungi te uni e tari ai, pati tarangi pati tarangi, tu tato tari ai tu tato tari e. No tu no tane no rongo no tango ra hia, pe tungi te uni tungi te uni e tari ai, pati tarangi pati tarangi, tu tato tari ai tu tato tari e. No moko no maroro no tahu no paki hau ra hia, pe tungi te uni tungi te uni e tari ai, pati tarangi pati tarangi, tu tato tari ai tu tato tari e. No rongo mai whenua, no rongo mai tere, no nunuk, no tōria, no tapatira ea, kei tungi a te oni, tungi a te oni e, tari ai, pati tarangi, pati tarangi, tu tātou tari e, tu tātou tari e, hoka mena tai, mero. Just to pass over to Susan to make some introductory comments before we start. So kia ora, uana. Kia ora, koutou, kā noe te mihi aroa, ki a koutou e tēnei wā. Um, warm greetings to you all and, and especially to William and Vicky for, for, for bringing us into this space so beautifully. George, thank you, and to your team for getting us here. Um, and Maui and I would like to thank in particular, of course, the iPinch family, the iPinch um, tribe as it's become, and the Canadian Social um, Sciences and Humanities Research Council. We'd like, of course, to thank you all for being here, and our um, thoughts and our mihi go back to our own team back at home, who are at least with us in spirit. So this presentation today is going to be in two parts. Uh, the first part, I'll be talking to you about uh, Moriori history, culture, and, and identity, and uh, what has happened in the past and what we are doing in the present and our aspirations for the future. And Uwana Susan will cover more details with the iPinch Cultural Database Project. So this here, this first slide, gives you an indication of where Arekohu, or Chatham Islands, is in relation to New Zealand. That map probably puts it a little bit closer than it is. It is in actuality. It's about 800 kilometres east of New Zealand comprising two, one main island and a smaller island. About 600 people live on the main island and about 30 or 40 on the smaller island pit. Just briefly, the origin traditions for my people. Moriuri were the first Polynesian people to settle Rekuhu, or they named the island Rekuhu a misty island or island in the mist. And the founding ancestors were Rungumai Whenua and Rungumai Tere. Rungumai Whenua literally means peace over the land. Rungumai Tere means peace on the sea. So with founding ancestors like that, it's probably little wonder that our people developed these, this tradition of peace making and peacekeeping, which defined, I suppose, Moriuri culture more than anything, any other single thing. So our traditions say that Rungumai Whenua and Rungumai Tere arrived directly to Rekohu, Rungumai Tere went on to Aotearoa, or New Zealand, that was settled about the same time by the ancestors of the Māori, and there was a period of voyaging between Aotearoa and Rekohu, but that um, exchange ended about six, seven hundred years ago, and Moriuri developed our own culture, our own dialect, which is, so we're Moriuri Māori, both Eastern Polynesian, but evolved separately. As I said, the, the distinguishing feature about Moriuri was this covenant of peace. And when the ancestors first arrived, they were a warrior people. There was fighting, killing, cannibalism. And our traditions tell us that this law of peacemaking had been passed right down from Rungumai Whenua, down through the generations. Um, and the Nuku is famously the last historical Moriori leader to have renewed the covenant and he was sickened by the fighting that he heard on the beach so he went down and he brought the two warring factions together and decreed that from this day forward never again uh, let there be fighting and killing and 
he decreed that um, from that day forward the people were to live in peace and if there was any dispute or any conflict they could fight with a wooden staff called a tupurari about the double thickness of a thumb first blood drawn, honour satisfied, no killing so that became the law that governed our people for the next five or six centuries Europeans first arrived in Arikohu in 1791. Um, in fact, there is a connection here with Vancouver indirectly because Lieutenant Broughton was sailing in tandem with Captain George Vancouver. They'd been down to Dusky Sound in the South Island of New Zealand and were making their way north to Tahiti and Vancouver was on his way up to discover Vancouver. Um, and they got separated in a storm in November 1791 and Broughton um, found his way to Lepo. At that stage there was approximately 3,000 people uh, living on the islands. Um, Vancouver, uh, rather Broughton stayed long enough to shoot a moriori on the beach. There was some misunderstanding over a fishing net. Um, however, that's, they marked their short stay by killing one of our people, planting a flag in the ground and claiming the islands in the name of King George V. That was followed by the arrival of sealers and whalers who brought diseases, slaughtered the seal colonies that our people depended upon. I'm sure that's a familiar story up here in the northwest. Uh, and it's estimated about 300 people died as a consequence of diseases that were brought. But worse was to follow for Moriori because in 1835, two Māori tribes from New Zealand, Ngāti Mutunga and Ngāti Tama, uh, decided that they were going to invade the Chathams. They were looking for new lands. So they arrived uh, on the Lord Rodney, an English sailing ship. It was like a mercenary run from New Zealand out to the Chathams. There was about 900 of them who came in two boatloads. And our people... Um, initially welcomed them, fed them, sheltered them, nursed them back to health. And that hospitality was repaid by the newcomers beginning to takahi, or walk the land, killing um, and enslaving Moriori as they went. About a thousand of our men met um, at a place called Chao Pātiki, an ancient gathering place of our people, to debate what their response would be. This was in March 1836, so clearly after a few months they could see the writing on the wall. Now the young men, being young men, they wanted to fight back and said, we outnumber the, the invaders three to one, um, and while many of us you know, might fall, eventually our, our greater numbers would prevail. But the chiefs, including my great, 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 great ancestor Tōria Takarehi um, forbade fighting and killing because the, that had been outlawed centuries ago and that had governed their way of life in the islands for 500 years. They actually placed the power of life and death out of the hands of man into the hands of their gods. But they hadn't had a situation like this before, at least in half a millennia. But the power of that covenant of peace they'd made with their gods was so strong that the people reaffirmed that covenant and said, no, we will go back to our villages, we will offer peace, we will offer to share the resources of the land and the sea. That offer was rejected. So Moriori became, there were about 226 uh, killed in the initial slaughters and the rest were enslaved and they were forced to violate their tapu, their sacred obligations to their gods, and um, they became a subjugated people. They were, intermarriage was forbidden. Um, many of the, in one incident, there were 90 men, women, and children staked out on the beach, alive with stakes thrust through them. Well, they were still, and then they were cooked in a big hangi pit. So there was brutal things that happened. And while I, I've always understood that Māori 
um, did this to one another to some extent back in New Zealand, um, there were gross excesses that happened on record. There was nowhere for Moriuri to escape. Um, and so they, um, there was a, a massive decline in the population. And not only did they suffer physically and metaphysically, spiritually, but they became a political football in New Zealand history and the education system. On the one hand, Māori saying that Moriuri didn't exist, and on the other hand, Pākehā, or European New Zealanders, claimed that Māori had driven Moriuri out of New Zealand, because they were the first settlers, supposedly, and the remnants sought refuge on Rekoku, and therefore that justified European dispossessing Māori. So, where did that leave Moriuri? In no man's land. In fact, we became literally a myth. And all of the degradations and all of the things that had happened and the legacy of peace became a figment of our own imaginations. But these people you see here are not figments of my imagination, they're my ancestors. Um, the man with the staff, the Tupuari, is Hiramana Tapu. And Tapu, we have a great deal of gratitude to Tapu because he was a visionary, because he saw, he was a boy of 11 at the time of the invasion. So he had witnessed some terrible, terrible things. But when he became a man, he set about recording all of the traditions and all of the knowledge and all of the language um, and the songs migration traditions and the names of every man, woman, child and baby who was alive at the time of the invasion. The man second from the uh, right is my great-grandfather, uh, Rangi Tapua Hurumuna. And sitting in the front, uh, the woman in the middle, just, just here, this is my great-grandmother. And these people continued to petition, write petitions to the government of the day. This one here was a petition to Sir George Grey, the governor of New Zealand, urging that Moriuri had not been defeated in combat, or what Māori called takiraupatu, claimed by conquest. What my great-grandfather described it as was taki pohuru, killing of a defenceless people, a people who refused to fight. And I've never considered myself to be conquered. And I've stood in front of Māori elders and kaumatu and Aumarae, and I've said, I don't feel conquered. I'm standing here in front of you. My spirit, my identity, my heart is still strong. So, as I alluded to before, Moriori um, had became taught in the schools. In 1916, they put out a school journal that was teaching all this misinformation and untruths about Moriori. So generations of New Zealanders then grew up believing myths about Moriori, that we were Melanesian, that we were weak, that we were inferior because we didn't fight back. And in my way of looking at it, it takes greater courage to respond in a peaceful way than it does in a violent way. And so my ancestors showed great courage, the greatest threat they'd ever faced. Now we can stand here today and judge whether they did the right thing. But I believe that in their time, that elevated their consciousness to a high level about what it meant to be human beings, not human doings, human beings. And they weren't going to kill again. They weren't going to cannibalize one another again. That wasn't being a human being. That evolved from that stage and they weren't going to go back. And in taking the stand they did, they passed that tonga, that torch onto this generation 
to adhere to honour that legacy. The last lone speaker of um, Moriori was Hiroana Tapu, who died in 1898. So the language hasn't been spoken as a language since Tapu's death. But we're fortunate that there's a lot written uh, about Moriori and recorded the dialect, the language, the songs, the karaki, the prayers. So we hope one day to revive as much of that as we possibly can. Identity is also inextricably linked to land. And as you'll see, um, when the Native Land Court was established on Rikuhu, uh, we lost just about 100% of our land. So the population, as I said before, plummeted result of killing kōngingi, people just literally sitting and their spirit leaving. We're out of here. We're not going to be part of this world anymore. They had the power to do that. They were found dead in the morning. Who had been the day before a healthy human being, the next day gone. The spirit just left. This photo is interesting. Here you've got this classy colonial lady posing for a photograph with two remnants of a dead and dying people. I'm sure she displayed that photo to all of her friends. Look, this is what's left of these savages. And this is what the plead to Gray, this is the words that Tapu used. Pretty powerful words. And then when we had the tribunal hearing, the tribunal in its report found that the scale of slavery and what happened to Moriori was on the the nether end of the darkest side. Now what's worse, in my view, than what happened to Moriori is the fact that the Crown in New Zealand knew that this was happening and did not intervene to do anything to stop it. In fact, the earliest interve intervention was in 1870 which resulted in Moriori being deprived of all of our land. A gentleman there, this is taken about 1873, with sitting with the staff and the kura, and the feathers, the albatross feathers, they wore in their hair and their beard as a symbol of peace. The albatross was a taonga, sacred to Moriori. And that's my great-great-grandfather, so here you see population loss graphically shown from 1791, 1933 when my grandfather is reputed to be the last full blooded but actually I believe there were others who survived him, who escaped to New Zealand, were taken as slaves who hid their Moriori identity from view because of the stigma of being identified as Moriori. Ah, Moriori was weak, was a slave. No, no more. This is my grandfather, Tame Hurumunarehi. He doesn't look conquered either. In fact, my grandfather was the new number one in his day on the island, he rose to that position. Um, not because he was the last full blood of Moriori, but because of who he was and what he did for the community and his generosity of heart and spirit. And I think he reflected in those qualities the best aspects of what it meant to be Moriori. And that 
young girl there is my auntie, Ramani, with her, her pet, Twana, black swan. These are other photos of Moriori taken in the late 19th century, <coughs> coming on the Heta and Rupiha. These are figures of some of the key families that um, survive today. I've mentioned about the Native Land Board Awards. This gives you a, an idea of how much land went to Ngāti Mutunga and how much went to Moriori. Of that 2.7%, um, the 2% 2 2 of it still remains in um, our ownership, and that's the land that's owned by my family at Manuko on the southeast of Rikuhu. I'm just going to skip through these. Um, these slides, but you know, there was a, a collusion, I believe, between the court and the government of the day, which resulted in all the land going to Ngati Mutunga. Because by 18, the mid 1860s, most of the Māori who had invaded in 1835 had returned to New Zealand. There's only about four or five left in 1870. But the court never, and there was about a hundred Moriuri back still living on the island. But what the court did, said, ah, oh, now you fellas have been conquered. We're going to give it all to these four people. And then their relations started. And what they did, well, they left, started leasing it all out to all of the Europeans, farmers. So there wasn't enough land left to sustain my people. So they, they were forced to leave. When, when you leave, when you've been oppressed for two or three generations, you don't want to be identified as Moriori anymore. So many grew up as um, Māori or Pākehā families and lost that link. And this is what we put to the tribunal, our story, when we were able to tell our story in 1994-95, loss of life, loss of land, loss of liberty, loss of language. All of those led to loss of identity for 170 years. And this sort of gives you a, an idea of how long our claims have been going against the Crown. In fact, the first claim was filed by Hedewana Tapu in 1862. It's now 2013, and we still don't know when our claim's going to be settled. But I know that the Crown want to, to settle for less than what we're prepared to settle for, because we're not going to sell out our ancestors. They didn't die for nothing. Just a few more photos of the ancestors. The process of Renaissance began in 1980. Here's some of the things that have been happening. And I just want to acknowledge down the bottom, I've mentioned the Eye Pinch Research Project because that's been a really important part of our Renaissance because it's helped to spawn other projects that Susan will talk about um, after me and this afternoon. And also a chance to stand here in, amongst you good people and have our story heard, to tell our story to listen to your stories, that you may take it back and share amongst your people. One of the, the high points in my life certainly was, and for other Moriori, was the opening of our marae in uh, January 2005. Here we have the Prime Minister and the Māori Queen uh, to the left, coming on up the path to the marae being kāranga, called on. You'll note the Chatham Island flag flying above the New Zealand flag. That's what I like about that photo most of all. Actually, the cooks in the Marae decided that, so right, which flag is going to take precedence? Oh, I don't know. That. And, okay, we'll leave it to the cooks. The cooks said, no, you put that Chatham Island flag up there first. <laughs> and here's um, some photographs of our beautiful Marae. And the Marae stands as a tribute to the ancestors' legacy. And in that, on that 
post, the pau, ka paua rangitokona, the post of rangitokona, the ancestors to be propped up the sky, is all of the names of the ancestors who were alive in 1835. Every name is written on that pau. So you're not forgotten. Your legacy lives on. The legacy of hope and inspiration lives on in this generation. And um, at the top there, Teku Teku is Runga Mai Whenua. He's guarding the front with his tupori. So the law was, don't kill. But if you come into that marae with an evil intent or a bad thought, you're going to get whacked around the ears with that tupori. Metaphysically, <laughs> I've seen it happen. Uh, and Runga Mai Whenua is guarding the back. But when you go into that house, if you go in there with the right spirit, it's just like this warm blanket is put around you like that. I've seen it with, it still happens every time I go in there, but I've seen it with people who, from all over the world who go into that house. Why? Because of the energy and the power that comes out of that hope. Because of what the ancestors sacrificed, what they believed in, what I believe in, what we believe in, the hope for a better world. Now, I was talking to someone yesterday that peace is an aspiration. We as human beings are always going to fail to meet that standard all the time because of our natures. And that's why the law was. You can fight till first blood drawn, then honour satisfied, no killing. Now we've got to look at different ways of conflict resolution, conflict management. So what are the lessons that we're going to learn from the ancestors? How are we going to develop those modes of conduct and values and put them into practice today? I've talked about the school journals already. But in 2007 through to 2000, 2006 actually, through 2010, we worked with the Ministry of Education to write a whole new series of school journals for this new generation and upcoming generations of New Zealanders, and they've been put throughout all the schools in New Zealand. Um, a copy have been given to George and the team. Many of these young children on Rekohu contributed to the journals telling their stories, what it means to be Moriori to them. So now, hopefully, the next few generations will know the truth. So I'm going to, uh, to leave it there, and I'm going to call on my lovely Uwana to um, get her recorded on. I hope I haven't used up too much time. <laughs> A Māori, a Takutāne, Takurangatera. Um, can you hear me all right? You've seen the pictures of our beautiful marae. That's where we're privileged to work every day. Um, you can see that there's plenty of room. So even though we're a long way away, we've got, we got room for you all to come, come and see us sometime. Um, <clears throat> strong sense of identity is what has prevailed through what Maui's been talking to you about. We believe it's closely bound to with the struggle to maintain that balance between environmental and economic imperatives with it protecting our <coughs> cultural heritage. And this whole revival process that Maui has outlined has led to our eye pinch case study. We think that, that when you've got a connection with place, that's the core of your cultural well-being. When we do this work well, we feel better about ourselves because we're carrying out the responsibilities of good guardianship. There's also a connection, I believe, between knowing and caring. So when you know about a place, you know how to look after it. Uh, Maui has described some of the effects since 1791 on Muriuri and on the islands. 
it would take another whole lecture series to tell you about the details of that. But can I just say that from day one, it was taking, taking, taking. Artifacts, human remains, even whole trees to remove their carvings. The entire trees were taken. More Moriori treasures exist in museums overseas than, of course, on the island. We've estimated that 350 at least ancestral remains are in overseas museums waiting to come home, and they are coming home, believe me. So more Moriori have left those islands unwittingly than from any other Pacific nation. And when you think about it, if there was a population of around about 3,000, 350 is a lot. It's a lot of people to leave. <clears throat> so it would have been better, obviously, for our project if no work had ever been done at all. Because in that survey work was this building up of mythologies. And if it weren't for Hirawana Tapu, who Ma we talked to before, and those hundreds of pages of documentation, we would have nothing to go on. There was no thought either in that work to working in a landscape context. Archaeologists work site by site in those easily obtainable middens and burials. There was no thought either to talking to Moriori because they were still there, they were still on that land. And that absence of Moriori voices resulted in a rewriting of their history by others. The good news, of course, is that we are engaged in the process of revival, and, and as Maui said, I pinch is a wonderful part of that. We started out in 2008 with an approved case study, and these are our objectives. Recording with our elders, mentoring our young people, and I, that picture of the launch of the school journals, there were children from the three schools on the island there. We don't have many young people. They leave the island aged 12 for a period. But mentoring them to come home, um, developing our own field methods and exploring options in a very innovative way to protect our heritage. A big part of that is then looking at the ethics of how we do this work. And very quickly we decided we're going to do this right, we're going to develop our own ethical protocols, we're going to do it our way because we weren't fitting in with anyone else's. And so we thought about it and we thought, well, if you can protect these things, this is such a simple filter. How will this benefit the Moriori? How will this benefit the Ekohu? And what about those yet to come? So if we can answer all of those questions, then I think it's gone through a pretty robust filter and, um, and normally the results are good. The next paragraph in yellow is, is a preamble from our own ethical protocols. It's, it's wordy, um, but right at the heart of it is that word integrity. And if you behave with integrity, then you're behaving ethically. And those are very, very close to those Moriori core values of sharing, unity, and peace. So um, we now maintain in our project a way of working that is distinctly Moriori. When we did this, we explored um, we explored all sorts of things. We explored GPS uh, layering, we explored um, mapping projects, predictive modeling and so on. And through a series of actual chance, or maybe there's no, no such thing as chance, encounters and talking with other indigenous communities facing similar problems, led us to a group in Northern Australia, uh, a young man called Victor Stephenson and his elders had developed a system called Traditional Knowledge Revival Pathways. And that was in response to environmental degradation and the lack of connection of elder knowledge. And Victor um, met up with us and he said, I'd like to give this to you. We were the first community to receive it outside Australia. <coughs> and. Uh, the way it works is very simple. The slide there, the little blue slide at the bottom, um, shows us a circle. The whole concept of TKRP is that everything that we do in the landscape is interconnected. So those little pictures relate to 
the sea, the land, the people, the spirituality, the animals, the plants, but they're all completely interconnected. On the other side is what happens when you take your digital camera out into the field and you record an elder, or anyone for that matter, then you then record that knowledge, you bring it back to your computer back at the marae, and you then set about attaching key words to that film clip. Very simple. Well, the kids obviously did it a lot better than we did, but <laughs> those key words then enable that film clip to be searched through any one of those topics. So, for instance, if Maui's out at our beautiful um, home at Manuko, and he's talking to the children, as he often does, about the ways to sustainably take the food from the sea and to respect that process. And then it might occur to him to talk about a shark god or, or, or a guardian, and perhaps to reflect on what it was like when he was a kid and stories from his grandfather. That camera can keep rolling. There's no need to say, oh, no, 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 we're, we're just here to talk about how you get the power out or the fish. Keep that flow going. Because then when you get back to the studio, you can very easily just attach those clips. The film stays exactly as it was, but at any time in the future, you can then say, oh, I need to do some work on um, um, Moriori guardians, sacred knowledge about protective species, or maybe memories just from the Solomon family. All of that can be immediately searched. So, um, notwithstanding a few technological hiccups about living on a small island and our own um, skill shortages, we're getting there. Um, the other great thing about it is that you have, for all time, a fresh, immediate document of that person speaking. So you can imagine in the future, maybe 20 years or more in the future, there is Ma we're talking, there is, you know, one of the old, older people talking. You don't have to read about it in those school journals or the books anymore. There they are, giving you that message about that land. When the software was given to us, it was given to us as a gift, and they stress three core elements, and those three core elements have now formed the body, the heart, if you like, of our iPitch project. That's us having a good time working. <laughs> the first element was the gift, this idea of reciprocity. It fits well within our project because it's part of that moriori value of sharing. Um, we have developed in this project many collaborative partners. We've adopted an action research approach of involving all of those partners in analysis, reanalysis, re-planning and refreshment. We found that reciprocity is a powerful organizing force through most of Pacific nations and I'm sure, no doubt here, it's a fundamental part of um, how you organize a social group. Culture is sustained, literally and metaphorically, through reciprocity. Living and thriving in a remote community is increasingly dependent on respectful reciprocity to each other and, of course, to the land. And I particularly like that, that quote from Hyde. We are unable, without that reciprocity, we are unable to enter gracefully into nature. Moriori, of course, lived knowing every marker, every part of their landscape and their seascapes. It was a very powerful, reciprocal relationship. The second strand, the condition of that gift and the strand that we work by, is that we do everything in the landscape. We have a landscape approach to our archaeological recording. We go out into the land with a very special exception, of course, of being in our marae. And, of course, this knowledge sharing in that place as well. But otherwise, if you're going to talk about a place, you go to that place. Place is a living relative. 
place is a lived experience. It's referred to, we talk about it, we experience it as if it were a person. Place, landscape, has the ability to provide that physical nourishment as well as the spiritual nourishment. And where we've got one of our elders, Tom, who, who joined us a couple of years ago here in, in Vancouver and Tofino, and he's with our children. We tr so trust this man that we send our, our kids into the field to eat poisonous berries and they were fine. They were good. He taught them about their fishing techniques. When Tom teaches those kids, it's like university level learning. And you know what? He only has to say it once. Not like us. And the, I hear them repeat things. And I said, how do you know that? And they said, Tom told us. Okay. Tom told you. The other important thing about when I talk about landscapes, the landscapes of the island are not just terrestrial. They are our seascapes, our skyscapes, starscapes. The seas and all the paths between island to island and rock to rock where Moriori fished and hunted and gathered are marked with sea tracks, safe voyaging places. It's very, very cold, dangerous water. You need to know that like the back of your The third strand is this intergenerational component. And when the software was given to us, its creator, Victor, he said to us, put those young people behind a camera because when they're doing that, they're listening. Plus they're better at it. <laughs> and it's so true. Quietly listening, focused. We found in our work that, um, and in our connection with other indigenous communities, that there are, there are also two other kind of commonalities in the process of revival. One is the need to assert autonomy, and this is what I said about developing our own ethical programs right from the start. These are our names, our way of doing it. And the other is a real urge to be innovative. And this innovation is part of the digital technology that we've, we've tried to embrace in our project. And we're very grateful for um, the iPinch flip cams, which we're using one today. That was fantastic for our field work, absolutely brilliant. The use of digital technology, too, enables us to, to share data, to store it, to protect it, to sort it. It also enabled higher levels of participation. Now when you're doing this kind of work, you've got little cameras and leads and all sorts of things, microphone, there's a job for everybody, whatever their skill levels. We found that in our work, um, we need to excite and engage our young people. As I said before, there aren't many of them on the island. They leave age 12. It's not easy for them to come back. So opportunities to, for engagement with elders are very, very precious. When they come, we take them. When we engaged, um, when we immersed ourselves in our iPinch project, we developed two youth workshops as a core part of the, the initial digital um, camera use. Our first workshop, we, we learned how to record our own treasures and the people from the museum traveled to the island and they helped us and the, the young ones made the, the nesting boxes for the tonga. They learned how to conserve them. They learned how to label them and understand them and take care of them. They developed their own museum display and every time they come into that building they go, we put those there, we chose what goes in there and this is what they mean, but this is how we understand what they mean. We had a workshop on the how to copy images and protect our paper records in a high resolution format. Absolutely vital in a place like that. It is so damp down there, everything gets like this, so protecting it was vital. We train them in how to use the cameras. They trained us better in how to use those cameras. We developed a mentors database. What we did most of all though, I think, is that we developed deeper connections for those young ones. Some of them had travelled from New Zealand to attend. They'll never forget it. 
and as they said here, we looked after each other. We made food together. Well, we actually made them go and get their food and then help cook it and then serve it to others. It was wonderful. This engagement um, has what's kept us going. I think um, I, during Maui's talk, I, I found myself feeling that Again, that, that, that hurt, that, that real sadness in there. So these, these projects, this revitalization, this engagement, lifts everybody's spirits so incredibly. And, um, and our collective work with iPinch and working with the other indigenous communities and the case studies has really set a fire under some of the work that we're doing. And, um, and I want to thank you again very much for the opportunity to do that and to share with you.